This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Good afternoon. I'm Carol Christ. I'm the director of the Center for Studies in Higher Education. I'm delighted to welcome you here today for um, uh, John Douglas's talk on his new book, uh, the, flag the New Flagship University Model. Uh, John has a very unusual career, and I want to tell you a little bit about it. Um, John uh, was an undergraduate at Pitzer College. Then he went to UC Santa Barbara to a program in uh, regional history. And at the same time that he was a student in that program, he started working in the planning department in, um, at UC Santa Barbara. So he had, in the years in which he was a graduate student, this kind of double perspective on the academy. He was both um, a, a staff member involved in academic planning, involved in the kind of research you do in the planning department, as well as working on first working on his master's degree and then working on his doctorate in history, the result of which was this wonderful book, The California Idea and American Higher Education, which has been my Bible since I became director of the center. It is the authoritative book on the history of uh, the California idea in um, higher education. He's also written another book, The Condition for Admission, uh, which is about um, the debate about admission um, at uh, universities, who gets admitted and on what basis. Uh, he um, subsequently worked at the office of the president um, as staff to the academic senate in which he continued to do a lot of analysis, position papers um, at the same time that he continued his career as a scholar. And then we were very, very lucky to have him gifted to Berkeley and the Center for Studies in Higher Education where he is a senior research fellow. Uh, John is also the architect of the very big data collecting project on student experience, CERU student experience in the research university uh, that um, collects uh, um, research, um, collects data, survey data on students um, at uh, mostly public uh, research, AAU research universities in the United States, and also about 15 or so international universities. And it's a really rich and exciting data trove. So um, I'm so excited to welcome John here, and, uh, and he's going to tell us about his new book, which you can buy outside for its outrageous price. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Carol, and thank you for noting how expensive the book is. <laughs> it's, it's really, I fought Pilgrim McMillan on this and lost, and it does make you wonder. But uh, in any case, thank you so much for that kind introduction. And I just want to say a, a few preface notes before I launch into some slides that I hope will explain in part the uh, idea of the book and some of the, its main themes. Is, uh, this original idea for the book uh, came about when I was in uh, South Africa. I had an affiliation with a project that's looking at uh, how to develop uh, sub-Saharan African universities uh, that's based out of, uh, uh, out of Cape Town. And there was just this constant, uh, uh, constant uh, uh, rhetoric and, in, and feeling of pressure about this concept of world-class universities among a series of universities that are, with the exception of Cape Town and maybe Stellenbosch and a few others, really you know, are in a different realm, in a different world. Uh, and uh, so I started saying, well, why don't you start using flagship metaphors? Because obviously I have some, my historical uh, research and background and knowledge, at least of uh, how American higher education developed in the public's uh, flagships and specific, specifically. So I started saying that and I gave a presentation saying, here's an alternative way of thinking about it. So that was kind of, that was in 2011, I think. 
Uh, so it was a long time ago. Uh, and I kept kind of working at it and realizing that, uh, uh, like a good capitalist, uh, uh, there was a market need and could I figure out a way to provide an alternative narrative that would be attractive. And so that's what this book is partly about. Um, and I will say that this presentation is really focused on an international global audience. It's not really strongly related. And there is obviously things related to the American system. But I really uh, focused uh, the book uh, on this larger global global world and what's happening uh, with the universities or, uh, uh, and, and, the, and the policy uh, um, uh, pressures that are facing from ministries and otherwise. So I, I begin by you know, saying a couple of just basic things that kind of summarize the intro of the book. It's a familiar, familiar if not fully explained paradigm. A world-class university, which this, this concept is quite explicit and, and ubiquitous, is uh, supposed to have highly ranked research output, a culture of excellence, uh, great facilities, and a brand name that transcends national borders. But perhaps most importantly, the particular institution needs to sit in the upper echelons of one or more world rankings generated each year by nonprofit and for-profit entities. That's the ultimate proof for many government ministries and for much of the global higher education community. Um, uh, but really, uh, what is wrong with this, uh, with this model? I think uh, we can relate to it because it's familiar to us, this concept of the land-grant university and its, uh, its strong relationship to regional economic development and socioeconomic mobility. That's the history very much of land-grant institutions. But this is a kind of a newer concept or uh, within, uh, within, an, within much of the, uh, of the world in Asia, South America, Africa, uh, but even in Europe to some degree. It's not that the current rankings are not useful and informative. The problem is uh, that they re represent a very narrow band of what it means to be a leading or what I call a new flagship university. So I'm taking this language that you're somewhat familiar with and saying, Let's look at the, what it means to be a leading national university uh, in a more broad way. And then I feel that I'm updating this model and talking about it in a more broad way. And I really do think that the universities of today, particularly the large public universities, are not the same institutions they were 40 or 50 years ago in their sheer scope and scale of activities, their budgeting, just a lot of different ways to look at it. Um, further, WCU advocates, world-class university advocates, do not provide much guidance or knowledge on what organizational behaviors and methods can lead to greater productivity in research, teaching, and public service to best meet the needs of, their, of the societies they serve. Now, I don't, that's not to the exclusion of the concept that we're, universities are engaged in the process of knowledge production and cutting edge, re, edge research and being internationally engaged. But I'm trying to use language that refocuses some of the discussion. So in this brief, brief uh, tour of, uh, of, the, uh, of the book, uh, first I'll just say a few uh, probably familiar complaints about ranking. Um, uh, something about the ranking and uh, world-class university psychology and its, and its behavioral effects, um, and a brief discussion of the model. I can't really get into everything. I'll kind of give you just a little conceptual aspect that will look familiar to you. And then I should note, in the book itself, the, uh, it's structured in a way that I then asked leading uh, scholars in higher education in different parts of the world. Here you can see, look at Asia, Russia, Scandinavia, and South America, and Chile being part of that. Uh, ask them to then look at the model, tell, uh, describe to some degree the history of their leading national universities and how this model makes any sense uh, in their particular uh, part of the world. Now, I'm not going to talk about that too much because that's too much to talk about. Um, but to the rankings, I think you know this. You may be more familiar with the, uh, the United States structure of rankings, which is really global, are really um, uh, focused on consumer guides. But in the international realm, there's a series of, of, uh, of rankings, uh, there are many rankings, they're growing like crazy, but there are a couple of big ones that just stand out and are, uh, uh, that uh, influence ministries and, and universities greatly. Probably the most significant is the Shanghai Jiao Tong uh, uh, ranking, uh, which is, uh, was originally uh, funded by the Chinese uh, uh, government in order to get a sense of where Chinese universities were in the realm of, of research out output. Uh, but there's also the Times Higher Education uh, ranking and just 
Qualtrics, and there are just a, a number of them. So, uh, but what about these? Uh, well, there, you know, there's not a lot of change at the top uh, in these rankings. Uh, uh, and in fact, uh, sometimes the changes in the rankings within say 100 or 200 are so small and kind of not very meaningful, but yet they become very meaningful <laughs> to ministries and to universities who know that they're, they're being uh, evaluated on their rankings. Uh, they're heavily biased towards the sciences and engineering, and that's because they're heavily focused on citation analysis. Um, uh, and I think there are huge limits, growing limits in citation analysis. Uh, that's because there's a proliferation of journals <laughs> like uh, uh, it relates partly to the explosion of knowledge, but also uh, there's a lot of demand to create more journal articles and get on lists, the government lists, to show. Uh, 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 and there's all kinds of other inflation going on with, with uh, um, cross indexing among authors and these kinds of things. Um, uh, and then some, uh, not the Shanghai Jiao Tong, which is one of its strengths actually, as in terms of its methodology. Many have uh, a bias because they have reputational surveys. And I tell you, if I ever get a survey, which I do occasionally, actually I never fill them out, I always put Berkeley number one. So. <laughs> and you should do the same. <laughs> Might as well play the game, right? So, <laughs> so this is just a really qu uh, simple way of looking at m what the matrix is for most global rankings. Uh, as I said before, the GI, uh, uh, um, the, uh, 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 Jiao Tong, I'm sorry, the uh, Shanghai Jiao Tong uh, uh, ranking does not use uh, uh, reputational surveys and perhaps is a more, uh, you know, it's uh, also it doesn't ask for institutional based data. You know, when you're asking for institutions for data, sometimes they don't necessarily answer exactly in a balanced way. They're, they're conscious of uh, the process. Uh, I'll only say that we can see that in SAT score uh, um, reports to uh, uh, some of the American uh, uh, ranking agencies as well. So there's, there's bias going on and, and favoritism. But I think the thing I really want to note is that um, this is a process of ranking that's a bell curve. It's a, it, the concept is that there really are a group of institutions that sit at the top of the bell curve and everybody else, well, you're just not that good. And I don't think that's a very, uh, effective or uh, well-reasoned way of thinking about what universities do uh, within their own particular national context. So, um, so why is this happening? So one of the reasons is a lack of trust. Uh, ministries are concerned with the overall quality and efficiency of their national systems, and uh, rankings give them a benchmark that they didn't have before, so it fits into this desire and need um, that also relates to, uh, you know, an anxiety that they don't have uh, top-ranked universities uh, that are competitive, and of course it feeds into uh, growing both valid and rhetorical information about the knowledge society and how important universities are uh, in that process to be economically competitive. Uh, also, governments need and like goals. So, you know, Tony Blair came out in the late 1990s saying, you know, we're going to have so many universities that are top ranked. Uh, I can't quite remember the number now. It was one of the first governments to come out and say that, make that statement. Um, and, you know, it was based on this concept, uh, really an un unachievable goal to some degree, if you really took a hard look at it. But there's, there's, uh, uh, there are, reasons that politicians put up unreasonable goals or whatever. Uh, it's a way of thinking, it's a way of uh, creating uh, uh, expectations, so that's uh, an important thing. And besides, everybody is doing it. So at first, it was a kind of a series of institutions that were uh, leading in this regard, and I'll, I will point to uh, Germany as well as being one of the first countries to also uh, not only uh, uh, identify the need to have so many institutions, universities in uh, various rankings, um, but also to put uh, policy, uh, put together um, uh, uh, what they call excellence programs to provide funding sources to try to drive that uh, 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 goal towards uh, greater rankings. So, uh, and I will say there are benefits. One, it has often provided new resources targeted in theory, often, you know, for a specific kind of program, uh, usually not 
sometimes block grants to institutions, as in China, uh, but often uh, targeted in some form. It's also created a stronger sense of competition among uh, national universities, and that's not all bad. Uh, it may, has made them, for example, become much more uh, engaged in strategic thinking where they weren't doing hardly any at all. Uh, they had a very much of a civil service kind of uh, mentality and structure. Um, uh, uh, one of the things that big changes that is, are going on is a significant change, uh, shift from uh, civil service structures of faculty uh, uh, um, uh, advancement to uh, more performance-based uh, based, uh, um, uh, uh, criteria. This is, I think, a very positive thing, although there's lots of noise in that, how they're doing it sometimes. You, could, uh, you might be astonished at some of the, uh, uh, at some of the um, uh, uh, kinds of <coughs> benefits or you can get if you get a journal article published in this or that journal. So there's some things that are a little bit off on that. But, and the other thing is there's been lots of concern that there's this new government money coming in various forms or demands that uh, you know, it'll somehow make the universities uh, uh, really uh, continue to be, the, uh, shall we say, lapdogs of the ministries or the current political regime. Uh, but I think there's also a lesson historically to know that academics are really good at uh, taking money and kind of doing what they want with it. If you remember, and I reflect a little bit on uh, concern about the federal university in the United States in the 1960s with the growth of federal funding after Sputnik, uh, was lots of discussion here at Berkeley as well about the federal government kind of taking over and, and controlling. But I think in many ways, universities just knew how to really bend the money in various ways to, to their own benefit. Um, so I mentioned a few. You may be aware it's just a frenzy of goals out there by various ministries. I'm only mentioning a few of them. And these are stated goals. So Germany, again, I noted uh, uh, that uh, began one of the first what they call excellence programs. Again, these targeted kind of programs in order to, uh, with the express purpose, uh, to have an influence on rankings and this conceptual link with world-class universities. They want 10 to become elite. Now, I'm, I'm not going to tell the exact definition because it varies, top 50, top 100, whatever. Usually, uh, Shanghai, Jiatong, but it could be a mix. And believe you me, there's a pro proliferation of rankings. Everybody's creating rankings of their own that can favor their, their own institutions. Uh, the European Commission has done this. We, you know, they're oh, so unfair that Shanghai, Jiatong, you know, we don't have enough German universities in the top uh, 500 or 100 or whatever, and so they create their own ranking structure. But um, uh, Germany is a very good example. Australia uh, wants 10 in the top 100. Again, never completely fully defined, but basically pointing to the ranking structures of some sort. They'll pick one of them when they figure out where they've, when they've done it. Uh, France put in $2 billion for initiatives of excellence, very much influenced by the German. Uh, excellence program, and this was at a time of in the middle of the Great Recession. They were putting money into this, into the an attempt to elevate the universities in France, understanding that there's a different dynamic with the Ecoles and all that. Uh, China, 20 to match uh, MIT. Russia, five in the top 100. Japan also has uh, something, and I think if I, I didn't reference it here, but I used to. Uh, Nigeria is claiming that they're going to have like, uh, I think, 10 in the top 500 in X period, or they're going to define it themselves. They don't say the exact, the exact uh, number. So uh, all I can say is do the math. <laughs> it's a bell curve. Well, you can only have so many institutions. And in I know you can, maybe you can have 20 institutions in the top 10, I suppose it's possible. But. <laughs> I, you know, if you can give 110%, why not? So, uh, so you know, it's just not reasonable. There are also, and I don't want to dwell too much on it, really significant behavioral uh, impacts on institutions. Uh, you know, uh, there are, as I said, national policies on faculty advancement and emerging in many places, or there are versions that are at the, at the institutional level, and uh, they're really focused on uh, citation analysis. Uh, can you get a journal article in X? If you do, uh, you could get a $10,000 raise in your salary or have access to an apartment, or there are all kinds of things going on that I think we would find within, uh, say, the UC Berkeley culture 
questionable as to how they're structuring these incentives. Uh, gaming, uh, the UK is a great example. There's a different culture because there's a ranking within the UK and within England uh, that has been ongoing since, uh, since the early 90s, in fact. Um, and uh, there's, uh, it's a, it has been, although they're going through one more reform again, a cycle. And within each of that cycle, um, uh, you, uh, uh, you see uh, faculty just changing from institution and various deals being made in order to try to get the faculty person with the most citation analysis. And they have a scheme basically is that future funding, funding for you in the future is based on past performance. Uh, I think that's a questionable uh, way of looking, looking at how to fund research in, um, in England. But again, I will say also many of these, uh, these funding structures also fit into a, a desire that I think is uh, reasonable, and that is uh, the need for mission differentiation among institutions. Much of this also is an underlying <coughs> policy issue for ministries. A, now recognize that not every institution should be a research-intensive university, so they tend to look at ways of indirect influencing the, the system. Um, so the world-class university really dominates, uh, and that means it's, it's really focused on very limited uh, uh, ways of looking at research productivity. Um, so I think there are a lot of problems with this, and I think many others do. Uh, but instead of just always complaining about it, <laughs> I'm trying to think of an alternative narrative. Uh, world rankings of universities provide one window into, much broader, into a much broader range of activities that leading uni research universities pursue and accomplish. A narrow band of research activities, as I said. Ranking is here to stay. It's not going away uh, with the good and the bad. But how to modify and shift this paradigm uh, in this discussion uh, both externally with ministries and internally within institutions themselves. That's a very tall order. I understand that, uh, but I think I at least have an angle on it to some degree. Uh, I also want to make a couple of observations from my viewpoint about top performers, those that you see on the top rankings. Many of them are rather old institutions or fairly, although look, if you saw, you know, the UCs do extremely well in all of these, and so some are not that old. Um, but uh, current top ranked un universities are generally, I would say, n have never been and are not uh, 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 built around narrow bands of quantitative measures of research productivity. I don't think we could say that's what drives Berkeley. Obviously, we do want to be productive in research, but we see a much broader range of activities that faculty are engaged in and our purpose in general. Um, uh, and I think still, this is, one might debate this some, but I think uh, the path to national and, and, and then therefore international relevance is rooted in larger socio socioeconomic purpose of the institutions themselves. And within that, and this is something I really emphasize in the book, uh, and again, I think it does reflect a bit of uh, American and UC culture and experience, and that is that internal organizational cultures and practices uh, focused on self-improvement are really the key for institutions to make the next step. Sometimes the ministries and the things that they've done have been very influential in, in, some t in, in various areas, as I've said, uh, very positive. But I'm trying to argue that at some point, the ministries need to back off that they are not going to make these institutions get up to the next level of really being top performers, uh, whether it's in a ranking or some other way of looking at the institution itself. So that's another message I'm trying to give and hoping it might have some reverber reverberation uh, within ministries. Um, so now I'll try to talk a little bit about what, I, what is the flagship model. Uh, I've indicated some things about it. So it's what I call the hard part number one how to define it. So uh, this is not an easy task, and I, it was a bit of a mind twister, and one creates a construct around it. So one of the things I do in the book very briefly, I don't try to dwell on this, is to say, well, here's one way of looking at the public uh, uh, flagship university, a leading uh, research-intensive institution. Obviously, other institutions can have aspects of this as well, but I think it does reflect to some degree the public institution uh, for example, uh, um, in the uh, 
uh, advancement of a more equitable society. Um, so I don't want to overly focus on this, but it's, it's a kind of a general conceptual idea. Uh, you could create your own, I'm sure, that would be pretty close or have as much validity. But I will say that if you do look at this, you can see, well, where does the ranking structures that I just described, how do they fit into if you kind of agree with this outline? of the purposes of an institution uh, broadly defined. Uh, you can see it really only relates to creation of new knowledge to some degree. Uh, maybe it leaks a little into productive uh, research environment. It has nothing to do with, uh, with teaching students uh, or uh, trying to create the next leaders of a, of a nation state or otherwise, or public service, or uh, co-curricular activities that we now are understanding more and more are part of a larger a series of opportunities for students to grow and mature, um, or this also relates to faculty research that has impact on local economies or local governments or communities, for example. And in fact, there is research that tends to show that this ranking structure is pushing out research that we might say is very relevant for local and regional economic development. That you know, there's it's not valued in the uh, uh, increasing number of international journals. Uh, so there are certain kinds of areas of research that are valued uh, but are not showing up. So this is just kind of a general way of looking at it. Uh, uh, but now I want to give you a couple of things that I say in the book, uh, again, trying to construct uh, uh, a way of talking about this. And one is that I say, well, here's, there's a series of flagship assumptions, and this is not the only ones. But um, uh, these are some of the uh, highlights. Uh, leading national universities are evolving. Uh, and the importance and range of programs and activities uh, um, and expect expectations of stakeholders are growing and public universities have to respond in some form to that. I do say, and I do think mission differentiation, there are some exceptions. We might talk about the German system and its success in terms of being a highly productive uh, research environment, not just the universities, obviously, but the Max Planck Institutes and others. So there are some exceptions to this, but generally, you do need mission differentiation. And I think most governments and ministries now understand that. As I said, they're usually not having an overt discussion about this because it's politically difficult. But they're doing various funding structures to help and uh, reinforce that in some form. Um, I reiterate, it's about internal culture and what I said before about trying to move ministries away from being so invasive and understanding at some point there has to be an internal culture among the faculty and and, and uh, leading administrators to make uh, to really be uh, make uh, gains in uh, in the quality of their activities and uh, always this culture of uh, uh, of evidence based management is also this concept that you need to have institutional research capacity. I talk about that. Believe you me, that's a very new concept in most institutions, um, or just marginally understood. Uh, that's changing quickly. Um, and I also state that leading, fla uh, leading flagship universities have a responsibility to the larger system of, of higher education. Now, that's a really alien thought, generally, through most of the rest of the world. Because most of the rest of the world, universities are islands into themselves. They don't see themselves as part of national systems, really, except for civil service, maybe, and the faculty and unionization and that kind of thing. But they don't have a strong sense of their responsibility to the larger system. That's starting to change, and there are bits and pieces and stories that are, uh, are focused on this. Uh, in England, the further education sector, conceptually, there's trying to have some regional relationships with institutions. You see that also in Belgium and in the Netherlands. And so it is starting to shift, but it's a, it's a big, it's a big uh, uh, cultural change. And I also mean not just when I say leading, a re uh, having a nurturing role, that means also creating policy and practices that are, can be seen as replicated in some form or having in other institutions or having formal relationships with other institutions. One area that is constantly discussed about but is very difficult to achieve is this idea of transfer, of students transferring. So that's kind of a, a newer area, but uh, another example. Um, I also say that Generally, flagship universities are comprehensive institutions. I don't mean to exclude those that are highly uh, focused on science and engineering, and many universities internationally are 
you know, China, for example, heavily uh, uh, invested more in STEM fields than social sciences, and they're weak in the social sciences in these areas. But generally comprehensive institutions, broadly accessible, this concept that excellence and the potential of human uh, of, of, of young students uh, is uh, not necessarily based simply on, uh, on whether you're rich or whatever, but that you have policies that can provide broad accessibility uh, that is uh, sensitive to demographics in your region. I also argue a bit for the concept of um, service areas. You may not know, but at one time that was a significant part of the University of California's concept of how it would uh, uh, service uh, and enroll uh, uh, Californians. It's kind of dissipated. It's coming back in a little ways, but um, obviously not unusual. Uh, uh, a certain level of autonomy and public finance. Uh, again, I say a movement towards institutional research capacity. And so I'm trying in this structure, which I can't completely describe, to create a common narrative, but one at the same time that is not so limiting that uh, different national cultures and uh, uh, political uh, uh, environments can adapt in some form pieces of it or otherwise to make it their own as well. So that's, that's a bit of a struggle. Um, so now, uh, here's hard part number two, and I'm kind of coming close to the end here. Um, uh, this is the way I try to construct thematically, well, what is it, as you saw the earlier slide about the objectives uh, and purpose of the public of the new flagship university, which is to my mind very different than the old one, old traditional uh, flagship university, and this is an interesting point brought up by the uh, by the contributors uh, to the various chapters, is how much their national leading universities usually, depending on where it is, uh, Scandinavia being different than the other examples, um, really don't understand this broader view of their relationship. Uh, for example, in public service and otherwise, uh, and also uh, uh, really dysfunctional uh, management structures internally as well. So there's a lot of things that, uh, that go with that. But so I've outlined a kind of a way of talking about this. And what I do in the book is I outline this construct um, and uh, I then uh, provide brief kind of uh, chat sections, I should say, on each, and then I and I I provide examples. So it's not just that I'm talking about, uh, like for example, student engagement. What are the areas in which universities can be really working hard or can uh, uh, move towards greater engagement, which I think we see as a value. And then to also give you a reference point, many parts of the world are still struggling with rote teaching methods by faculty. Okay, and this is. It's changing, and there's a real understanding among the top institutions and often the ministries that this has to, there needs to be a change and, and a shift in that, and there are policies for it, and some institutions are doing more than others, but it's a relatively new conceptual idea. So even the idea of learning communities or uh, undergraduate research structures focused on supporting undergraduate research activities and what benefits are from those, those are relatively new. I will say to you as well, though, do you know the structure that we now have around undergraduate research, which is really significant at Berkeley, I think it's really a remarkable story, is very different than it was 20 years ago. Uh, the Boyer Report, from some of you remember, came out, and it did have an influence on UC and many other institutions to become much more organized and see value in giving undergraduates a chance to do more organized, often faculty-directed research. So I digress, but that's the kind of thing, and I show examples, whether it's, yes, Minnesota, but also ETH Zurich. I made a conscious effort to look uh, across internationally. I will say there are a lot of examples from Berkeley <laughs> as because uh, in the UC system in general, for example, around issues of faculty advancement. Uh, one brief example is that uh, uh, many institutions don't have very clear uh, statements as to the expectations they have for faculty you know, beyond that they teach so many courses, perhaps, but it's not a well-articulated concept as to what they're supposed to be doing and then also what they're being evaluated on. 
uh, partly because many of them came from very strong civil service structure. They didn't have an, need an evaluation system. That's beginning to change, and it's a very difficult process for many of these institutions. So I do provide those kind of examples. So I won't digress into more of that, because that's a big part of the book. And I'll tell you one, one thing. It wasn't a lot of fun to write. <laughs> it was very difficult and a little bit laborious, but I felt like it was something that would be useful uh, uh, for the goals that I've outlined for the book. So finally, a few concluding uh, remarks. Uh, this book implies a high level of policy and practice convergence among leading national universities. This is an area of debate uh, among scholars of higher education, uh, and particularly when you go to Europe, um, there's lots of um, dislike of the ideas of hierarchy, uh, but uh, and and questions about uh, cultural imperialism, other things. But I think uh, I've been in this argument for a while, and I think there's a lot of the higher ed scholars have erred on the on the side of of not really recognizing the tremendous level of policy transfer that's going on in the modern era where we're looking out over our shoulder and seeing what our competitors are doing. It's really a remarkable thing. And so I often ask this question, is there such a, a thing as a Russian way to have a research intensive university, a Chinese way, a German way, a Scandinavian way? And I think there probably is at the edges, but it's a remarkable level of convergence if you look at the policy realms that I've talked about and see the attention that these institutions are beginning to pay about it. Governance is another area really significant changes going on uh, related to governance. It's a long haul. Um, it's not meant as a litmus test. I keep saying that. It's there for adaption. Um, it's, it's, a, it's aspirational. It's not supposed to be something that says describes an institution in one moment in time, but it kind of gives an idea, an aspirational idea of what institutions might be looking at and how to change the rhetoric uh, related to world-class universities. Um, you know, so it's not a litmus test, but there also has to be enough commonality uh, in my story in order to make it somewhat uh, 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 compelling. I, I do have this little section in the book where I kind of go through these problems and go, I don't know if I can solve all of them. Uh, but another is to ask the question, well, how does one become a flagship university or use that rhetoric? rhetoric do you need to be appointed by the ministry to do such and gives it some money? Or is it a self-identity? Uh, I don't answer that because I think I'm hoping that um, it depends on the circumstance. Uh, uh, and again, you know, this is perhaps uh, um, wishful thinking on my part. Uh, so it was difficult to create a, a common narrative. I will say that I suffer a bit from US uh, Berkeley bias affliction. It's a disease that we all have, I think, to some degree. Uh, but uh, that's the nature of, uh, of scholarship to some degree in this kind of an area. Uh, obviously, the model I'm uh, pushing and, and trying to say uh, might be a narrative that somehow could be adopted in different parts of the world is non-quantitative. Uh, it doesn't really le lend itself to matrix and uh, uh, the kinds of things that ministries and uh, many universities desire. Um, to rank it in some form. I mean, you could imagine some, and there's some that try to do these, these uh, more broad-based uh, efforts. Uh, there are many other rankings that are trying, but it's very difficult to have consistent data, <coughs> and it's uh, broadly recognized. So, ministries really, really want metrics. So now I'm saying this this model has no chance at all. So, <laughs> but here's my final thought. Uh, the fa flagship model provides a path for some universities to explain and seek a revised institutional identity to help them build a stronger internal culture of self-improvement and ultimately a greater contribution to economic development and socioeconomic mobility rates that all societies seek. I think that's a kind of one way of saying the importance of flagship national public universities. So. But for that to happen, some group of institutions will, need, institutions will need to embrace some version of the model on their own terms and articulate it clearly and loudly. So that's kind of the way I've concluded. I will say I have a little hope. Uh, there will be a conference in Zhejiang University around the book's themes. Uh, we have one of our uh, visiting scholars from uh, Zhejiang here, uh, Mozi Wang, 
and uh, they'll have a conference around how does it fit within the Asian world, and another publication will come out of, out of that. So with that, I'll take some questions. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question that might um, be a little bit opposite of what you're thinking about making other, helping other universities become flagships. I'm wondering as a historian if you have any sense of how universities that have been at the top for a long time get dislodged. Um, you may have noticed we're in crisis. Uh, we're having a staggering debt right now. We're being asked by the governor and the president to take over 1,000 new students next year and an additional 1,000 the year after. We don't have anywhere for them to sleep or classes for them to take. Um, what will it take to dislodge Berkeley? Oh, we're also going through a strategic planning process that's probably going to happen too quickly because of being driven by financial um, crisis. So I'm just a little worried. Um, and so what can you tell us about how universities, if you know of any, that have gotten dislodged? I mean, it's taken us 150 years to establish this reputation. How long does it take to ruin it? Well, I think the line usually is that, you know, it's a very short period to ruin a university. <laughs> but I will say if, if we rely on the Times Higher Ed uh, ranking, which in which about 30%, I think, of the ranking is uh, reputational, we'll do just fine because there's a huge legacy effect. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not, I think, not reassuring enough. Sorry. No, no, I don't. <laughs> but uh, on the more serious side, we have something very precious here, as you probably know. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And I, you know, I think I, there are people in this room who are more knowledgeable than I uh, about what the campus is facing, um, and it does seem very significant. Um, and I think. Uh, you know, I still have a hard time uh, understanding at the moment, although I will, you know, I understand that there are broader needs for Berkeley to service uh, California, but uh, to continue to grow when it doesn't have a financial model uh, in order to really sustain that. And I think the, the big area I look at often, although it's hard to get accurate data, is faculty to student ratios and to see those numbers going up. So my question would be, and I know that Andrew Zeri and others are obviously very concerned about this, and the chancellor, uh, is that, you know, when you're at, tw I don't know, I know the system-wide average is 21, almost 21 to one graduate and, and undergraduate. Uh, Berkeley's probably somewhere close to that, uh, but, um, uh, you know, you're pushing at the edge of the other institutions that we know are competitive in the U.S., and I think I would say generally, if I understand, a Michigan is more like 15 to one or something like that, and if you look internationally, Usually it's like 17 to 1 or something like that. But again, there are the troubles with numbers on this because how you count faculty and all that stuff. So it is, it is a big concern. There's still time. <laughs> the question is how to, how to write that ship. But I, I feel, you know, I'm more and more I used to you know, feel that the university like Berkeley should take its lumps and, and do its job in taking on students. But I don't know how you can figure out a financial model to keep to continue that without some other leverage of resources and obviously tuition is a significant one. I like to say that tuition can be too high and it can be too low and it's both about access and we know now that you know so far Berkeley's done a pretty good job at maintaining uh, the demographic needs mix at least socio socioeconomically. Uh, we've actually grown in low-income students in the last four or five years. But it's all the other part of the equation is what are the resources provided to the institution? And again, I think faculty student ratios are a good way to look at it. I don't know if there's anybody else who would like to make a comment about that question. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for a fascinating presentation. I'm curious. Uh, what uh, universities uh, you might point to in particular, say, over uh, the information technology age that have um, somehow transformed their uh, position on some of these lists? Um, and I'm asking this in the context of developing an online university that's uh, MIT open courseware centric uh, in seven languages and Wiki also, Wikipedia's in 300 languages. We'd like to have universities in all countries' main languages. Um, what would you suggest, um, if we're at all lucky enough to be incubated by the University of California and WASC Senior, which, which accredits Cal and uh, Stanford, for example, 
what would you suggest? Well, I do talk a little bit about online education in the book, and it's kind of like you're, you're hopping around a lot of topics, and I, it's not a super long book, uh, and I couldn't figure it all out anyway. So, uh, and I do think in terms of uh, extension and these kinds of things, that this is a really important aspect of, of uh, reaching out both to Californians and to others throughout the world. Uh, I think it is a question as how it fits and into the normal structure of degree uh, programs. I think we all are probably familiar with the New American University and, uh, and Arizona. But as far as I can tell on the Arizona example, it's really two classes of students. There's the online cl class of students and the, and the on-campus. And so that's a, for, a, for a university like Berkeley or, or UC, that's a big question. Are we going to have a really different structure of providing education in the normal degree program. I mean, I could argue at least uh, looking at some of the attrition rates uh, and some evaluation of the effectiveness of online education, again, I have a feeling you're much more of an expert than I am on this, is that you know it's, uh, it's, it's questionable for 18 to 24-year-olds. And that's another really important aspect of online education is how it fits with certain demographic groups. I think so far, we haven't seen a lot of efficiency at the 18 to 24-year-old level. The attrition rates are extremely high. So uh, at least it's a really important a part of the, of the puzzle. I still, for a, for a leading flagship university, I tend to see it more as a way to expand services, uh, uh, much as Extension did in the 1890s to the agricultural community. Uh, and so that's a very important part. But that el element of how it fits in with the structure of the institution and are we creating different classes of students is something I think is, is still weighs on the minds of places like Berkeley. A number of the um, countries that are trying to um, get 20 universities in the top 10 are um, uh, uh, countries with very autocratic cultures. And I wonder if you have thoughts about the relationship of, if not democracy as a form of government, a relatively open intellectual, um, a c culture of open intellectual debate and democratic traditions as important to developing uh, world-class universities. Flagship. 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 <laughs> <Sorry. That's okay. laughs> it's so pervasive. Uh, Yes, this is a part of the, in the book, absolutely. I point to, for example, uh, statements of, uh, of academic uh, freedom. Uh, I also, and I use, and again, I tried to shop around so I could show that there are many different institutions with approaches, and I used Columbia and showed their statement on academic freedom, but I also made, also provide the HIFA statement, if you're aware of the HIFA statement, that included the AU and uh, the European Commission and uh, I'm forgetting, uh, also I think Australian universities and some Chinese universities as well uh, about academic freedom and say every institution needs to have some kind of clear statement about academic freedom, that faculty are an important component of it, but it also extends to what right and privileges students have. And so this is uh, not, is problematic to some degree. I then do talk, I have this again, this kind of more contemplative section of the book where I jump around on different issues and say, you know what, if you're in a, in a society that has severe gender uh, um, discrimination, you can't have a flagship university. Uh, you know, I try not to overplay that, but uh, basically say within the realms of the things I'm talking about and the role of these institutions in socioeconomic mobility, if you share my value, that that's an important component for a leading national university. You know, many privates that do function like that to some degree as well, many Catholic universities in various parts of the world as well. But the leading national universities are really important in that overall uh, um, uh, ability to have mobility. And uh, so, uh, obviously, I think the Middle East is very problematic to ever being able to achieve a model like this. I do make some statements about open societies as well. And so I think it raises the question, although not directly, about what that means for places like China. Um, and, uh, but I, I leave that as, a, again, I say it's aspirational. I'm not trying to you know, create dividing lines that say, you'll never do this or that, and I don't say that. 
but that these are the values, and I'm hoping that occasionally maybe a ministry will pick this up. You know, you have to understand ministries, right? And I know we have some people who are very expertise in here. We have Rory Hume who knows these things well. Is that, you know, you go to, you look at these ministries in many places, it's a revolving chair thing. Uh, there, you know, it was the guy who was in transportation who's now uh, leading uh, the higher ed side. And their, their level of knowledge is often not that great or there's a very bureaucratic structure around it. I, I, I very, I very much admire the China, Japanese universities to some degree, but the bureaucracy of, of the ministry and things is like, you can't believe how many people are employed in the ministry and what the structures are going on. So uh, I'm at least, again, trying to be aspirational and say, well, look, this is an important consideration. If you really want to have a top-level institution, uh, a flagship in this form, you have to have certain basics uh, that are lined up. I also note in this vein and discuss and show examples of other very interesting studies in South Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa about what are the basic things that they need to have in that kind of environment, uh, you know, in Uganda or uh, in other uh, uh, various other parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. And they need to have so many faculty, uh, you know, who have PhDs, and they need to have a pipeline for that. So there are other pieces of that story that are similar uh, about criteria that it's very difficult to achieve that without having, a, for example, an academic, I call it, a, I use the language from this, this project in uh, South Africa um, uh, called the academic core. So I explain that. So there are other criteria like that. Sort of a follow-up to Carol's question. Uh, it's not only an issue in authoritarian regimes, but it seems uh, also the basic contradiction that I see played out in some of your examples is a ministry or a government setting a goal, top-down goal, to increase the number of world-class institutions or world-class universities. Uh, but your conclusion that the, to be successful uh, whether a democratic or an authoritarian regime, uh, you need to have an internal culture. I associate that with disciplines, professions, where faculty judge each other's work rather than having the work be judged by some outside. Uh, yeah. That has to be very strong that, uh, for, uh, for a, a university to advance uh, scientifically or in any, any discipline. So uh, isn't there a basic contradiction between the desire of most of the countries that you've listed, this top-down approach to increasing world-class universities, and the solution, the internal culture that you've described to be at the heart of the, of the process. I wouldn't call it a contradiction. What I, uh, it's, it's a challenge, mm -hmm. and it varies by where you are. So uh, in the uh, analysis provided by the other chapters and in things I've done with others is uh, the internal management structure is a big, big issue in the ability of institutions to achieve this internal culture uh, and also lack or just beginning to understand the need for institutional research and that there's something called, you know, it's a rhetorical term to some degree, but evidence-based management. <laughs> Sorry to use that term. But, um, so, you know, I think... Uh, um, it's not a contradiction, it's a major challenge. And I think we will see many of these institutions maybe in a different place in 15 or so years. And the reason is partly is there are a lot of shifts going on in that structure of governance. And France is an example in which institutions are, have been given much more authority uh, to manage uh, their resources internally, given more authority, uh, n not without criticism and uh, uh, concern as to how it's going to work uh, towards uh, the rector or whatever equivalent that is, the president. Um, and then what are these relationships between faculty and administrators? Uh, and and uh, so uh, I think I do t discuss this, and it is a very big challenge. And you'll see big differences between, say, France or Brazil, uh, where things are highly political, that uh, actual the leadership is often aligned with particular parties, political parties, and the students are as well. So uh, two examples in which you're seeing really significant improvements in internal management of institutions as well. So it's a broad range, um, uh, but it is, it is a major challenge for many institutions. And 
again, looking at Chile and South America, that's a major component of their discussion. But what I will say is eventually, and I do discuss this, if you're talked about uh, internal uh, quality assurance, I point to the basics, and that is hiring and advancement of faculty and the criteria that it's based on, that it's not civil service. I mean, there's difficulties with that. Um, program review as being another element of the internal cultural aspect of what you're doing. I, I, I have less faith in accreditation, depending on where, you know, what, what, how it's done, so. Uh, John, I have a question about um, uh, mechanisms to cultivate uh, a flagship. If I were sitting in a government ministry and I have uh, two bags of tricks, one, one would be, um, let's say, uh, uh, financial mechanisms to encourage flagship-like behavior uh, on the part of my uh, university, or on the other hand, um, uh, provide autonomy and um, uh, follow-up uh, to that university. Which is, a, which is a better path, looking at uh, uh, the history of what's been tried uh, to cultivate? Well, there's another path related to this, and that is, is getting back to Saul's question, is governance and management structure. And so if you do see uh, there have been steps being made uh, for many leading national universities, whether it's China or whether it's Japan, of creating greater levels of autonomy and ability, for example, often sometimes developing something like a board uh, similar to ours. So there's, that's been one element of what ministries have been doing uh, uh, sometimes, <laughs> providing that uh, level of, of uh, stronger internal management control by the institutions themselves. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, there's kind of a breaking point. At some point, I don't know what that is. At some point, I don't think that ministerial uh, 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 edicts about how to evaluate faculty or others are going to have the positive effects on institutions as opposed to trying to put pressure on them to do their own internal management and uh, improvement in their over, overall management. So uh, I think the early stage was exactly what you said, provide money in order to induce uh, behavior. Uh, and now the question is, can there be some kind of a transition to stronger autonomy of the institutions themselves? The uh, one presidential candidate who's speaking about higher education a lot is actually Marco Rubio, and he has these four points very, very carefully, carefully um, laid out. I thought you were going to say Sanders. <laughs> no, 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 actually, it's okay, Sanders. Go ahead, Sanders, go ahead. Sanders is just basically talking about fees. Rubio, Rubio has, a, has a, a much longer speech. Okay. Yeah. And um, he starts with, with uh, accreditation. He starts with his own experience of student debt. Um, and um, so um, he begins with, with a speech saying that um, he believes that the accreditation system is basically a scam. And that um, there are there is this much better way of delivering courses online, and but they're not accredited. Um, that's true, and it's not true. I mean, you can actually. Uh, he mentions Coursera and Udacity, for example, and you can, get, for an extra fifty bucks, get um, certification from Coursera, which actually is is not such a bad idea. But my question is totally open-ended here. Um, in it's by no means impossible that Rubio will be your next president. Uh, it, it's it's not likely, but it's not impossible. How would you advise him? <laughs> I don't think I don't think Mr. Rubio would listen to me. You know, I think the rhetoric. I'm not fully knowledgeable about everything he said. I know he gave a speech, and uh, I see him very much aligned with the Bush, former Bush administration, as to what they were trying to do. Uh, they were trying to get a hold of accreditation as a process to in, provide. You know. Uh, the CDL, a version of the CDL of learning outcomes tests and to provide much greater, the Bush administration opened the gates uh, for tremendous growth in the for-profit uh, university sector. So, uh, you know, the tendency of Republicans has been uh, 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 to, we need market solutions and uh, uh, the for-profit sector, although that rhetoric has died a little bit because of the, so much of the abuse that's been exposed, and I would say the credit to credit to the Obama administration, and they've used the process of uh, doling out financial aid again in the United States. 
We don't have a Ministry of, of, of Education so far. And uh, the two areas, the major areas that uh, have influence is research expenditures and financial aid. Um, and to some degree, accreditation, which relates to funding of financial aid. So I, I don't know. I tend to think of the Republicans just being uh, continuing the line that the Bush administration did before and would push that angle as much as possible and obviously would not be looking on the other side, which I will say, although I think it's much concerned about uh, the Sanders and, uh, and, and um, uh, the approach that Hillary Clinton has expressed, as far as you can figure it out, because it's all very vague, um, in terms of their, their uh, policy uh, uh, positions on higher education is the positive part of that is that uh, you know, they really identified this investment by states as the critical factor, uh, not the rhetoric of rising costs, which is you really have to unpack rising costs in terms of operational costs, you know, community colleges versus a major research intensive university. So they've really done that, and they have identified the for profits as being a problem, and it really is a big problem. If you look at debt, at the debt levels in the United States, Nearly, I think it's nearly half, or maybe it's 40% of outstanding debt is in the for-profit sector, and they by far have the most uh, students who go by default as well. So the positive, even though I'm worried about what it means and the concept of block grants, was in fact, again, going back historically, if you look at, there was a very similar debate about how the federal government should fund higher education in the 1960s, and in fact, right here in Berkeley, the Carnegie Commission for Higher Education came out with a series of very important reports that argued, no, you should fund students to then be in the marketplace uh, within some controls, then giving block grants to states or to institutions themselves. But sorry, the, the positive part is that I think it's identified this investment by the states as a major component, and the for-profits are a problem as well. So uh, I'm, I think that's a really positive development, that that's part of the political national discussion. John, John, thank you and well done. Uh, I, I think that the, the, the world-class university ranking thing is totally toxic and, and really dangerous for higher education. And so you're giving an, an alternative. Uh, trying. Yeah, you're trying. <laughs> and, and, and strength to your arm, and I hope you succeed. It would be fabulous for individual governments to pick up on this concept rather than trying to push universities into Shanghai Jiatong by lying, cheating, and stealing, which many of them are doing. But that's just my, my <laughs> preliminary comment. And you're, you're using this, this flagship thing, and I think that's a great idea. <clears throat> but a flagship usually has to have a fleet. <laughs> and for us, that's obvious. You know, the UC system is the flagship, the fleet is the rest of the master plan. And, and, and it, it's wonderful, you know, and, and like everything else, California shows the world how it, how it can and should be done. But what is Caltech's fleet? Well, I would not necessarily call Caltech a, a flagship in my definition. But the other thing I should say is it's a point, again, another contrast between the United States and the rest of the world with a few rare exceptions is that we are a nation of systems, national systems of higher ed education. If I remember right, around 75% of all the students who are in higher education are in systems loose, loosely defined. I mean, you call the community colleges a system, <laughs> but it is. Um, and so uh, when I, I talk about these relationships with, I'm sorry, I should say, most parts of the world, as I said before, institutions really are islands. They may have their own little small fleet, like Beijing Normal University has a fee-paying, a money generating operation. It's not the main campus. This gets a little back, back to your what you talked about, in which they're creating because demand is so high, uh, different kinds of parts of the corporation, shall I say? Um, but I think you know this this concept of systems is not going to emerge in, in, in the rest of the world. And when I talk about flagships, I'm really talking about having this larger socioeconomic role. And, but I do stress, but I struggle a little bit with it, and having ties with other systems, not owning them, but being partners with them. I think a great example is KU Leuven uh, in Belgium is doing interesting uh, work with other institutions in the region. Um, so I'm not, my definition isn't flagship in that form. It's more of a leader that is providing by example or by relationships as opposed to 
ownership. But that is a really in interesting aspect that's different. And it also affects the public discourse about higher education and other parts of the world. Because in the United States, at least we've had a history in California in which the leadership of the University of California, although many of you may not remember this too well, but felt obligated that we were part of this larger system and we took a leadership role. In ancient history, the Berkeley campus developed the concept of the AA degree and was the accreditor and one of the chief proponents of the community college. So that related for reasons that also fit its needs. This, that's ancient history, I realize, but that conceptual idea of being linked and speaking, uh, the leadership of the university speaking for public higher education in some holistic way, that doesn't exist in the others. You see a little pieces of it in these growing groupings of, of alliances like the Russell Group in the UK, in which they kind of, but they're basically associations to preserve their own, so. We have time for two more questions. Anyway, at, at the risk of asking a question. Uh, after but Henry, you weren't here for the earlier part of my talk. That's why. That's, that's what I'm about to say. Uh, caught in traffic from Palo Alto, uh, which is always a good excuse. In fact, I asked the question yesterday at a celebration at ScanCore at Stanford, where they're announcing a sister uh, group to start at the H School. Uh, and I said, and at that sister group, it'll, it'll basically be the virtual Boston University. And I asked, why not? In this area, in the Bay Area, don't we have that virtual Bay Area University? And there was no good answer to that. Somebody said traffic, OK? And today, I was caught somehow by a machine that took us over the Bay Bridge. So that's why I missed your, your talk. It's all by following one of those machines. Never do that. OK. Uh, so uh, well, to get a little closer to the question, uh, one thing your comments inspire was, I'm from the SUNY system. 30-year uh, sentence, uh, got, out, <laughs> got released about 10 years ago uh, to come to Stanford. Uh, but there, I saw over the years a desystemification. When I first there, there was the old uh, building at Albany, formerly headquarters of a railroad system that the university took over. But gradually, the building emptied out as uh, SUNY could no longer afford the bureaucracy that was supposed to run it. And now we see the more complete de-systemification. It's no longer SUNY Stony Brook or even SUNY Purchase. It's uh, Stony Brook University. And all of these schools have gotten their independence. Uh, and I think we're seeing that a little more slowly. It's a little more hidden in UC, but it's happening. And uh, UCSF made an explicit move for independence. Let's see what happens to it. But that is the way things are going. Uh, we're seeing de-systemification. And that's what you're seeing in uh, Europe as well. And now on the other hand, the trends going in the other direction, like KU Leuven or uh, Karolinska, what that, what's happening there is that these universities are incorporating the smaller schools around them because they need larger masses. Okay? And so they're taking over faculty lines. I watched the Karolinska move across Scandinavia, across Sweden, not only to encompass all the health uh, related universities, but also the social work universities. Anything to get another line. Yeah. Because they know that over a generation, you can take over that line and put whoever you want into it. OK, so let me, can I respond? Uh, in a minute, <laughs> in a minute. I want to get to a question for you. Well, I think you had a question. And I, what, what I want to say is that uh, you pointed to California, and I think you know this is something that I think we're all concerned uh, with. But it's a direct relationship to significant disinvestment in a public university that generally is, I think, fairly cost effective. I mean, we could argue about aspects of that. But if you look at certain data about the cost of educating a student, which is difficult, but it's consistent, you see a decline in the amount of money we're spending per student, is that this level of disinvestment threatens the system, threatens this conceptual That's idea. That's my question. Well, but you did bring that up, and yeah, I did want to state that. Yeah, but question. OK, because I, uh, that's all been taken care of. You've dealt with that in the book, and we take that for granted. OK, but I would like to, following up on the political question, OK, uh, Rubio is mentioned, and uh, Sanders. But the actual person who's president is Obama. And the actual head of the virtual higher education ministry has been Mrs. Biden, who is a professor at a community college. OK, but where's the question? The question is. 
Are we turning the whole thing on its head? And the community colleges becoming the leading model rather than the flagship universities? Uh, well, I would tell you that no. Uh, that the higher education, this is where people sometimes get, I think, a little, a little misled, is a uh, market of diversified providers that there's, there is lots of room for many different types of institutional types, including online, uh, and that we are in a world, uh, particularly outside of the U.S., of growing demand uh, for both enrollment and the products and things that we produce in the universities. So uh, my sense is that, uh, that that will retain itself and that Peter Drucker is wrong, uh, that uh, brick and mortar institutions will remain a vibrant component of a larger diversified uh, grouping of institutional providers. And that'll be the case in California. Like, I'm not against for-profit institutions. I'm just against the ones that are really bad. Uh, <laughs> and we have a lot of those. And we've had them, uh, California's had diploma mills since the 1920s. So uh, um, uh, this is an area with greater regulation or self-regulation that can improve, and there's a definite and significant role for that part of the, of the market, relatively new part of the, or growing part of the market. Final question. So, um, I, could you elaborate on the relationship between an institution's internationalization efforts, um, however you might define it, with the flagship model? And on that note, what are your thoughts on the plans for a Berkeley Global Campus and how that fits or <laughs> does not fit with the flagship model? Well, on the last one, I think we have some people in the room who can answer the question better than me. Uh, I'm still learning. Uh, but I would say I, w I do have a section in the book about international engagement. I knew that I, I, I had the danger here in the way that I tried to put a lot of rhetoric about, if again, the title of the book is Global Ranking to National Dash Regional Dash Local Relevancy. And, uh, but I, as I state in the book, that's not to say that institutions should not be internationally engaged. It's just the matter of where it sits in the larger framework of what they're doing. Some institutions think that international, particularly inter in China or other places, that international engage engagement equals uh, one, policy transfer, and two, a path towards higher rankings in some form. And they put so much of their energy into this particular area. I uh, remember at Tanji University uh, not so long ago asking them about how many uh, joint degree programs they had and they told me 95. I said, 95? And how big are they? They're just little things, you know. But it was all about creating these relationships without a lot of meaning or direction. So in the book, I say that, you know, that, is, that this isn't mutually exclusive to international engagement. It's a very important component. But there are a lot of institutions who are not being selective about what they're doing or thinking strategically about their, what they're doing. And I do use a, uh, some pieces of a taxonomy uh, that came out of a paper and we hope eventually a book that uh, I'm working on with Dick Fla uh, sorry, <laughs> with Richard Edelstein. And uh, Grace Tenary is also here as a visiting scholar helping us on that. But in this taxonomy, which I put up, um, you know, it says, what are the range of things and what's the areas of effort? And I would say, when you look at where perhaps a version of the global campus sits on that range from you know simply having student exchanges to uh, a branch campus or f shared physical facilities. That's a high level of effort. Uh, so uh, at least I, without a lot of judgment or knowledge, I would say that Berkeley has done some of a job of saying, OK, we're not going to have MOU MOUs with everybody and their mother. Uh, perhaps we're going to be strategic about uh, what uh, joint degree programs we have, even though we're asked by billions of institutions all the time to do it because it's again about, it's partly about show, it's about courtesy uh, and these kinds of things. And the flagship, I mean, sort of the uh, uh, Berkeley Go Global Campus, I don't know enough about it. It seems interesting to me. Um, and that's about all I can say about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> on that note, let's thank John. <laughs> um, and
and I, you can hear John speak again. We're um, a sponsoring in a little less than a month, about three weeks, a national symposium on undergraduate education in the Public Research University. And John is going to talk about what we can say about student engagement in a public research university from the CIRU data that, um, that we have so many years of and so many institutions worth of now. So uh, I hope that I see some of you at that, at that symposium. You have to sign up on the website. It's March 10th and 11th. And now please join us for a reception outside. <laughs>